on World News Tonight. Back to work. Ukrainian ports resume duties following a deal on grain exports. Aggressive hike. U.S. Federal Reserve raises benchmark interest rates by 75 basis points for the second straight time. Election deadlock. Hundreds of Iraqi protesters break into parliament denouncing the nomination of new premier. And it's a dance party. North Koreans dance away in traditional costumes to celebrate Armitage's anniversary. This is Other There in a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight and we begin tonight's broadcast with the updates in Ukraine. Three Ukrainian Black Sea ports resumed work, Ukrainian's Navy said, following a UN-backed deal aimed at releasing 25 million tons of cereals stuck in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Russian energy gas prom cut gas deliveries to Europe while the Nord Stream pipeline to about 20% of its capacity. It's a consequence of the war that's being felt far away from the battlefields as Turkey oversees the implementation of a grain deal struck between the two warring sides, there's hope that Ukraine, the world's fifth largest exporter of wheat, will be able to ship its harvests again. We believe that it's critical to, in, to ensuring global food security, so yes, we, we need to succeed. Russia maintains a maritime blockade in the Black Sea. It runs from the Russian coast to the Romanian border and prohibits any Ukrainian ships from departing, in particular from the strategic port of Odessa. Turkey and the United Nations will now check these ships as they pass through Istanbul, while military vessels will escort crews to international waters. If there's a need for demining, we will proceed as agreed by the parties. However, there is no need at this stage. Back in Ukrainian fields, farmers are still hard at work. But amid new attacks on the coast and a missile strike on Odessa just a day after the agreement was signed, many people are skeptical about the deal. I would like to assure that Ukraine will uh, do everything it can to make sure that this deal works and that Ukrainian agricultural products reach world markets. What remains to be seen is how Russia will behave. With some 20 million tonnes of grain stuck in silos, there's hope that the shipments will ease the global food prices. The cost of grain has soared, leaving millions worldwide at risk of hunger. Moving on to the United States now, tensions are building between U.S. and China as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is planning to visit Taiwan next month. And the geopolitical friction is receiving extra attention in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Tonight, tensions building between Taiwan and China, with the United States in the middle. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is planning to visit the island next month. She would be the highest-ranking U.S. elected official to visit since 1997. I think that it's important for us to show support uh, for Taiwan. President Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping are expected to talk on Thursday, with Reuters reporting Taiwan will be a key agenda item, according to a source familiar with the planning. Taiwan is self-governed, but China claims it as part of its territory, and Beijing has never ruled out taking the island by force. Taiwan rejects China's sovereignty claim and vows to defend itself. The U.S. doesn't officially recognize Taiwan as a separate country due to its long-standing one-China policy. But it has pledged support to the country in case of an attack or coercion. The geopolitical friction getting extra attention in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The concern that Russia's invasion and the world's response to it may embolden China. Taiwan's representative to the United States said this in February as Russian troops were mobilizing before their attack on Ukraine. Like everyone else in the world, we are watching the situation with much concern and anxiety. The Chinese have been threatening Taiwan through a number of means. Since Russia's war in Ukraine began, the White House has struggled with its messaging. President Biden made headlines with this exchange with a reporter in May. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. White House officials later clarifying that the U.S. was sticking to its historic policy. 
Nothing's changed about our one China policy. But the U.S. military says Beijing has already been rattling its saber. General Mark Milley said over the weekend that China has become significantly more and noticeably more aggressive over the past five years. Now, Taiwan is also stepping up their visible military presence, staging air raid drills early this week ahead of Pelosi's trip. <laughs> There's a rare bipartisan support for Pelosi's visit to push back on Chinese aggression. But China's foreign ministry firing back at Pelosi's plans with a firm warning. We are fully prepared. If the U.S. insists on going its own way, China will certainly take firm and forceful measures to safeguard its national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The question for Washington, what are those firm and forceful measures? Or is Beijing just bluffing? Now for the second straight month, the U.S. Federal Reserve has hiked its benchmark interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point, the most aggressive monetary tightening in more than a generation. The move is, a move is aimed at clapping down on inflation levels unseen in 40 years, and the impact of the decision will be felt beyond just the U.S., as countries around the world will also have to follow the Fed's lead. The U.S. Federal Reserve raised its benchmark overnight interest rates by three-quarters of a percentage point for a second straight meeting. At the end of its two-day policy meeting on Wednesday, the Federal Open Market Committee announced its largest back-to-back -back rate increase. The adjustment brings the cumulative June to July raise to 150 basis points, which is the most aggressive tightening since 1981. The short-term borrowing rates now stand between 2.25 percent and 2.5 percent, similar to levels in 2019. The decision, despite risking a sharp hit to the economy, was unanimously agreed upon by voting members of the FOMC to crush inflation, which is running at rates unseen in four decades. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring demand into better balance with supply in order to bring inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keep longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Powell said that this process is likely to involve a period of below-trend economic growth and some softening in labor market conditions, but added he does not think the U.S. economy is currently in a recession. There are just too many areas of the economy that are, that are performing, uh, you know, too well. And, and of course, I would point to the labor market in, in particular. Uh, as I mentioned, it's true that growth is slowing. And for reasons that we understand, really, the growth was extraordinarily high last year, 5.5 percent. We would have expected growth to slow. He also signaled a possible third hike, saying the Fed anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. The Fed's aggressive monetary tightening also has global repercussions. The U.S. interest rates have surpassed those of South Korea for the first time in two and a half years, which could lead to capital outflows from South Korea. To prevent this and to curb soaring inflation in the country, the Bank of Korea said it is likely to maintain its monetary tightening policies after taking the so-called big step of a 50 basis point increase earlier this month. It is desirable to gradually raise interest rates by 25 basis points for a while. However, an expert says although it could help stabilize prices, there could be side effects from the big step. Household and corporate debt have been accumulating since before the COVID-19 pandemic economic crisis. With mounting debt, private spending could go down. Also, it could lead to further polarization of society, as those in low-income groups are likely to be hit harder. Still in the United States, there are new reports saying that the U.S. Justice Department is investigating the January 6th riot and there are signs of greater focus on former U.S. Donald Trump than was previously known. 
Administration officials familiar with the investigation tell the Justice Department lawyers are trying to find out what President Trump was saying to those in his inner circle in the weeks leading up to the January 6th riot to try to undo his election loss to Joe Biden. Specifically, the officials say investigators want to know what he was telling his aides and lawyers about the effort to have slates of Trump presidential electors sent in from battleground states that Biden won and about urging Vice President Mike Pence to recognize those slates when Congress met for the official electoral vote count on January 6th. The officials also say investigators back in April obtained telephone records of senior White House aides, including Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. Those developments were first reported by The Washington Post. The fact that those records were obtained at least three months ago is a sign that investigators are moving more aggressively than was first thought. Some Democrats have said the Justice Department is moving too slowly compared to the pace of the House January 6th committee hearings. Attorney General Merrick Garland has insisted that no one is off limits to the Justice Department's investigation. We will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. At a rally on Tuesday in Washington, the former president said the investigations are politically motivated to stop him from running again. They really want to damage me so I can no longer go back to work for you. And I don't think that's going to happen. And in one of the latest steps, investigators are seeking to look at the contents of the cell phone of John Eastman, the lawyer who pushed the idea that the vice president could overturn the election results. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The Canadian government made clear that Pope Francis's apology to indigenous peoples for abuses in the country's church-run residential schools didn't go far enough, suggesting that reconciliation over the fraught history is still very much a work in progress. It's the latest stop in what the pontiff is calling his penitential pilgrimage. Pope Francis arrived in Quebec City on Wednesday, days after he issued a historic apology calling the treatment of indigenous children at the hands of the church a deplorable evil. In a room filled with government officials and indigenous representatives, the Pope begged for forgiveness on Wednesday. In this deplorable system promoted by the government authorities of the time, which separated so many children from their families, different local Catholic institutions played a part. I renew my request for forgiveness for the wrong done by so many Christians to the indigenous peoples. I beg forgiveness. The ceremony was attended by Governor General Mary Simon, the first indigenous person to occupy the post. With this visit, you're signaling to the world that you and the Roman Catholic Church are joining us on our path of reconciliation, healing, hope and renewal. An estimated 150,000 indigenous children were separated from their families and brought to residential schools between the 1800s and the 1990s. Many were starved, sexually abused or beaten for speaking their native languages. In May 2021, the remains of 215 indigenous children were discovered at a former residential school sparking national outrage. To date, more than 1,000 suspected unmarked graves have been found. French President Emmanuel Macron pledged to support Benin by investing in security, education and a new French cultural center in a joint press conference with Benin's president, Pratis Telong. Macron's visit to the West African nation comes after French opposition lawmakers warned of an alarming increase in human rights abuses in Benin. A strong handshake to signal a close friendship as Emmanuel Macron greets Patrice Talon, his Benin's counterpart. Security issues in the region where terrorist threats are multiplying were one of the main topics of discussion, as well as the military means to tackle them. We need military equipment and we expect an effort from you. We have the financial means to acquire it, and we know that you have the means to provide it to us. 
a request that was heard and welcomed by the French president. The president asked me for more sophisticated equipment, which we're going to provide, as this is a legitimate request. But we must never forget that a security response must be accompanied by a political and development response for it to be sustainable. Beyond financial and military talk, culture was a central point of discussion in this meeting. Macron and Talon visited the museum that features the 26 pieces of looted artefacts that were returned to Benin by France last November, a restitution project that should continue in the coming years. With regards to the new acts of restitution, I hope that we can create the framework that was introduced in a study a few weeks ago, and I hope that we can move forward. In his first visit to Africa since his re-election, Emmanuel Macron seeks to strengthen his influence on the continent. After Cameroon and Benin, the president is expected in Guinea-Bissau this Thursday. Iraq's parliamentarian building was breached by hundreds of demonstrators protesting the nomination of a new prime minister. Iraq had entered a record of 290 days without a head of state or cabinet since elections last October. Faced with barrages of tear gas fired by police, hundreds of supporters of Shia cleric Muqtada Sadr stormed the Iraqi parliament on Wednesday evening. They were protesting against a rival bloc's nomination of former minister Mohammed Shia as Sudani as a candidate for the premiership. We've broken into the corrupt parliament because we don't want Mohammed al Sudani. He's corrupt and there was corruption in all ministries in which he worked. The demonstration had been called by the cleric, whose bloc came out victorious in elections last October. But he failed to secure a majority, and months later, there is still deadlock over forming a new government. In June, Sadr called on his MPs to resign en masse, and his supporters have since staged a number of similar shows of force. Inside the parliament, his supporters wandered through the rooms once taken up by MPs. Others lined up in front of photographs of former speakers of parliament, their way to express their rejection of the entire ruling class. They destroyed Iraq. They destroyed our civilization. We don't have anything, no education, no health, no services. It's been 20 years and we've had enough. They must all leave. Prime Minister Mustafa al qadhimi called on protesters to withdraw immediately. And after a few hours, they left the parliament building without any major incident, responding to orders issued by Sadr. Microsoft and Alphabet results sparked a relief rally in heavyweight technology and growth shares and investors expressed confidence in big tech's ability to navigate a recession. Shares of Microsoft and Google parent Alphabet jumped more than 5% Wednesday morning, a day after both tech giants reported results that eased investors' fears over whether the high-growth companies could withstand a likely recession. Alphabet reported better-than-expected Google ad sales, while Microsoft said its revenue this fiscal year would grow by double digits. That sparked a relief rally in heavyweight tech and growth stocks on Wednesday, with shares of Apple, Amazon, Tesla, and Meta platforms all climbing higher. Investors have been looking to see if this week's earnings news from mega-cap companies might help the stock market sustain its recent rally. Mega-caps have powered the stock market for the past decade, but rising interest rates from the Federal Reserve to fight decades-high inflation have taken a toll on the stocks this year. Apple and Amazon are slated to post results on Thursday, which would conclude the earnings reports from the country's largest companies, as Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, and Amazon together account for nearly a quarter of the weight in the S&P 500 index. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The total number of cases in the monkeypox outbreak has now reached 18,000. The Director General of the WHO, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, said that the cases had been seen across 78 countries. A large 170-carat pink diamond has been discovered in Angola. 
Dubbed Lula Rose, the rose-colored diamond is believed to be the largest gemstone of its kind found in some 300 years. U.S. basketball player Brittany Griner testified in a Russian court that her rights weren't read when she was detained at a Moscow airport, as she stands trial for her drug charges that could see her face up to 10 years in prison. People have been lining up for the monkeypox vaccine at a new dedicated vaccine center in Paris, which was booked out in the first two days since the opening. Indonesian President Joko Widodo met with South Korean business leaders in Seoul. A business dialogue session was held where officials from the two countries shared thoughts on how they can work together on digitalization and energy transition. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with a look at North Koreans celebrating in style with a dance party in traditional costumes in celebration of the 69th anniversary of Armitage. Stay safe and have a good night.